possibly she'll take a bigger tusk bull. I think overall size, though, will have a lot more to do with it. If there's an estrus cow and there are a whole lot of bulls around, the biggest bull is the bull that's going to mate with her. So she doesn't have an enormous amount of choice in the matter. So normally, you know, the biggest bull, if there are a number of musk bulls around, the biggest one is the one that's going to uh, mate because he'll just bash the others out of the way. So she, does, she doesn't generally have an enormous amount of choice. That's a lovely question. It's a bit like the peacock's, peacock's tail. You know, what advantage would a long peacock tail have uh, confer on youngsters? And the answer is not much. In fact, quite the opposite. These elephants are doing exactly what Viam thought they were going to do. Hello, Hilna in the Netherlands. This question is related to the uh, last one that we had about the elephants that lift their lift their um, their feet up. Uh, you know, when they stop, are they thinking? Often, elephants will wrap their tusks over the, uh, their trunks over their tusks when they're feeling uncomfortable, where they're fidgeting, like I'm doing with my hands. If I'm feeling a little awkward. But sometimes the must bulls will do it when they're feeling kind of aggressive and like a sort of young teenager who's walking, walking with an attitude. So they flap the trunk over their tusks and they kind of march along as if to say, get out of my way. And then we do. Now, Viam, a little while back, predicted that they wouldn't drink at this water hole here. They would go to the cleaner water of a pumped water hole just around here, and I think that's exactly what they're doing. Thanks, John in Connecticut. Um, you managed to spot this herd of elephants walking past the uh, past the dam. Well done. We are hugely appreciative of all of you who watch our damn cams so please keep it up and please keep sending us your please keep sending us your updates I'm just gonna let them walk through this oh wow can you see this stronger what stronger <laughs> you can't see it it's too close Thank you, Matt in Texas, for taking the time and effort and bandwidth to do a bit of research on elephant twins. Um, you say that uh, the limited research, but that in areas like the Greater Limpopo Transfrontier Park, uh, which are enormous, uh, and in the wild, it tends to be more common than in smaller areas. Thank you very much for that. We are right next to one of the lodges, um, so if you see it, sorry about that, but they're definitely heading for that water hole that um, the Viam thought they would. Hello Ginny, you've heard that elephants have two-sided brains that are able to switch off half the brain in order to sleep. Now, I know that that is the case for um, dolphins, I think. Um, I'm not sure about elephants, quite possibly. They don't need to sleep quite as much though. You see, something like a dolphin obviously has to stay moving or it drowns. 
Whereas an elephant can lie down quite comfortably and be okay. The light, I mean, it's beautifully filmed by our expert VM, but it is just so spectacular here. Watch the aerial there. So now you can see they're moving far more than they are feeding. And I think that's got a lot to do with the fact that they're getting closer to the water. Now, I'm just going to take Viam's head off by mistake. I don't want to do that, especially after his sterling performance today. Okay. All right. All right. Look at the dust there. Oh wow. Oh that's beautiful. Hi Pamela, you say you've read of a sighting of a, an Asian elephant in the wilds of Africa. Now, I just watch out there, sorry, Vian, we're going to knock the area there. Pamela, um, excuse me while I negotiate this rather tricky part of the road. Um, I am most surprised by that. I have certainly never heard of a record of it. It's certainly not, Im I mean, nothing's impossible, but for a, an Asian elephant to have ended up here, it would have had to have crossed, um, well, let's work it out. It would have had to come from India, probably. I'm going to go along here and then onto the road, I think. It would have had to come from India across the Arabian Peninsula through the isthmus of Suez, across the Sahara Desert and fetched up here. So I think it's unlikely. Um, look, nothing's impossible and I may make a mistake. Um, it's possible that one escaped from, you know, it was captured and escaped off a ship maybe. Maybe a ship was wrecked somewhere with an elephant on it. Um, but I think it's unlikely. I'd be fascinated to know where you read that. Let's go straight to the water hole. Right, while we wait, I think these elephants have just arrived at the water hole. In fact, they have, they're drinking there now. Um, we're going to go back to Tingana briefly and see what he's doing while I get into position. And we will see you on the flip side, as they say. Welcome back everyone, as you can see we still with Tingana, this male leopard who has decided that he is going to go around the back of the termite mound as you come back. We just had such wonderful light with him in the background there. So I'm going to move now, see if we can see him again. Um, let's try to find him. He's going to be crossing the drainage line in front of us. Um, Oh, he's lying flat on the other side of the drainage line. I'm just going to try to find a way to get through there now. So, it's been a spectacular afternoon. I hear you guys have been having such great fun with uh, James and the Eddies. I'm just going to cross through here now catch up with that leopard.
Cheers, Dax. Ja, die sind halt ein öffnen Partners. So, BT would like to know about leopard twins. And I heard James has been discussing elephant twins. BTU. And um, BTU would like to know about elephant, I mean leopard twins, since James has just been chatting quite in depth about um, elephant twins. Um, BTU, it's, I've never seen identical uh, leopard cubs. Um, their spot patterns always differ and their coats are different. I myself personally have never heard of or have never see, seen identical leopard cubs. But maybe it is a possibility. Maybe if you guys could do some research for me and, and let me know. Um, see if you can ever find a record of completely identical leopard cubs. I've never heard of that before. Um, and you can send your answers to questions at wildearth.tv. Uh, or you can use the hashtag Safari, uh, the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. So guys, I heard those Ellies you are following have just arrived somewhere uh, to quench their thirst. So we're going to cross back to James and don't worry, we're going to be waiting right here and hopefully uh, this big male leopard decides to go quench his thirst very shortly as well. And we'll see you a little later in drive. The, um, there. Elephants are at the water hole, they're having a hard drink, um, except for one of them. And there's a there's a bull who the who we've been interacting basically for the whole with for the whole afternoon. And he is he's kind of he'd been on the fringes of the herd the whole day. Um, and Viram just said maybe he's in trouble and he's sort of making a joke, but I think actually that's exactly what's going on here. He's obviously done something to irritate the matriarch and he's being told to go to his room and stay in the naughty corner. Look at him, he looks rather forlorn and sad. I'm sure he'll come to have a drink just now. Anyway. Daddy aged five. What a lovely question you ask. Are elephants scared of anything? Addy, elephants are scared of one thing, and that is you and me. They are scared of people. Um, otherwise, in most areas, they're not scared of anything. Uh, the babies need to watch out for lions and hyenas, but when they're around their mums and dads, uh, they don't have anything to worry about. So they're a little bit scared of them, but the only thing they're of scared of is us, because we unfortunately have, have killed quite a few of them over the centuries. Nigel and Tula, some lovely questions. Tula, you want to know how many elephants there are here? While I answer Nigel's question, I'm going to ask you all to count them, along with Viam, uh, because he's sitting a little higher up than I am. Um, and Nigel, you want to know, you've read that elephants in a herd are normally related. 
uh, the, the that's the females and that is true um, maybe aunties and cousins and sisters uh, would a matriarch you say accept a foreign cow this elephant herds are not uh, defined like lion prides are where so if a lion pride uh, came across a, a strange female um, he they, they definitely wouldn't accept her but in an elephant herd uh, the matriarch I'm sure she would I, I mean there are there's, there are examples of young orphaned elephants being accepted into a herd so yeah they very much would now what's quite interesting here that, that elephant there the one closest to us I think is the matriarch and she's watching us very carefully she's feeling quite protective now and I suspect it's because they're quite vulnerable next to the water there's no noise of them feeding so she can hear my human voice very clearly and I don't think that makes her particularly easy so Addy if you look at that elephant look how she's behaving look how she's watching me carefully and that's because humans make them afraid yeah no, she's definitely communicated something to them and they moved away from the water straight away I can just hear the infrasonic sound and now they're going to move. Oh, it is just amazing. Do you have any idea on how much? I think 15 or 16. The reckons 16. Any advance on 16? Just see these young young bulls like to like to uh, watch us. Where's the naughty one? The guy's still in the naughty corner. He still hasn't had a drink yet. Now they'll start to feed again quietly. The coherence of movement is just amazing. Gerda, there most certainly is a drongo still stalking me. There was one just now that I asked for him to film and he actually couldn't even see it because it was so close. It was just next to the door here looking up at me. We locked eyes. Did that drongo and I. See now the chap from the naughty corner has come to have a little drink. He's been allowed in. And eventually that sort of peripheral existence will become permanent. They may join up with other bulls um, or with a much older bull and just learn the ropes from him uh, but he's heading for that kind of difficult time of elephant life it's difficult for humans too that adolescent time Hi Virginia and Diane, you've had a discussion on the Twitterverse about whether or not elephants can smell water. Um, I, as far as I understand, they probably can. That said, elephants learn where water is from their elders. Um, that's fairly sort of well established. So why a young bull, if you plopped him into the middle of the Kalahari Desert, I suspect without other elephants who've been in the area for a while, I think they'd struggle to find water. They, they, um, they can certainly, I'm sure they can pick it up much better than we can, and certainly they can probably read the weather quite nicely, so they'll be able to tell where there's, when the rains are coming. Um, I'm sure they can smell rain, a bit like we can, but probably on a more sensitive level. Um, but in terms of smelling water at great distance, I don't want to overplay that, because they definitely do learn from the older elephants in the herd as to where the water is. So I'm pretty sure, for example, that the youngsters wouldn't have been able to smell this fresh water necessarily when standing next to the, um, the dirtier water of the dam. Um, but the matriarch and the older ones obviously know where it is and they know where all the hot water spots are. 
not a huge it's not a huge issue here sorry there's the jonga that's been stalking me um it's not a huge huge issue here because there's water so you know now i think we're going to leave them when they walk away from the water hole here i'm not going to chase them through the thick bush there has been a spectacular sighting I must say the trunk spitting the water out one goes back and for those of you who don't know um, everybody uh, had as um, re reference to the drongo that was following me we had one the other morning um, pretty much at the same height that the one you're looking at now is but only two or three feet from the from the vehicle and the camera actually struggled to to focus on it it was so close that's wonderful so he or she mr or mrs drongo whoever she is he or she is is following the elephants and the, the land rover to pick up the invertebrates that we tend to kick up when we drive through the bush and push over trees and and uh, knock the logs off the ground so they're just two two youngsters left and unsurprisingly they're adolescents the young the real little ones will go off with the herd and these chaps will hang around like <laughs> like naughty teenagers on at the edge of a family dinner Look at that beautiful shot. I mean, the light is just, you couldn't ask for anything more spectacular. So that was a truly spectacular sighting. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. I feel, um, I feel at peace and I feel greatly satisfied with the afternoon so far. And we'll just gently drive across Absolutely spectacular sun set safari area. Yeah, you've been having absolutely amazing Ellie sighting with James. Um, Tingana has got up and he's actually moved away from the water. Um, so we're just trying to stick with him now. Oh, whoops, there's a big stump there. Um, looks like he's laying down. Um, we'll try to get us into a good spot, but he has moved into some thick bush, but it looks like he's popped out. You okay? Yep. Into the open. Oops. Whoa. Big stump. Can you see what I'm touching there, Andrew? Doesn't look like anything on the side. Let me try this way. Oh, there we go. That's just a, a quite a large log there. Move around a little bit. I know. Okay, we're gonna have to go forward. There we go. Easy peasy. Lemon squeezy. So when? So he stopped a nice little open area. Um, after that a little bit of thick bush we just went through. I'm trying to remove the thorns that are now stuck inside my leg. Well, apparently there's been some chat in the Ustream, a chat room, about whether that was a baby or full-grown diker. It was a young diker, but it probably it had reached full-grown. Oh, like this is able to feel calm and confident enough that he'll just flop down and lie down completely unhindered and unworried about us and within no more than six feet of where the vehicle is. 
we are very very lucky and privileged to be able to witness these type of things and it's so great to have all of you on the back of the vehicle um, we really do love sharing our passion and love uh, for the African bush with all of you wherever you might be in the world So what we'll do is we'll try and move around a little bit so we can get a view of his snoz. Hi Susan from Long Island in New York. Uh, welcome on the sunset safari season um, Susan would like to know do leopards hunt crocodiles um, um, and the Savuti channel which is flowing again at the moment um, dried up in the early 80s and there was a large population of crocodiles and, and hippos in the Savuti channel and the Savuti marsh but when it dried up the hippos moved through to the Lanyanti and um, some of the crocodiles decided to remain and there's a very unique for Botswana which is an incredibly flat country with no mountains or hills really um, a set of granite out outcroppings and what happened is these crocodiles during the dry season would go into caves in these outcrops and sort of just rest there and sort of go into a form of hibernation and not move very much and just stay inside these caves till the first rains came and then they would move back into the pans and um, and water that came with the rains and some leopards in that area sort of figured this out and they spent their time actually actively hunting these crocodiles the smaller ones out of um, out of these caves and they often did this towards the end of the dry season so when the crocodile was probably at its weakest and had been without food for the long longest period of time um, that's when they would take advantage of that. Uh, I've seen some amazing set of photographs from Zambia of uh, a young male leopard grabbing quite a decent sized crocodile and dragging it across a huge sandbank. So they most definitely do hunt crocodiles um, given the opportunity and the conditions are correct. Thanks very much for that. That's a, a really great question. It's not something you would think of too often, leopards and crocodiles. Hi Kashmira, welcome on the Sunset Safari, really great to have you with us. Uh, I hope you've been enjoying your time on the back of James and my vehicles. Um, Kashmira would like to know, in regards to what I said, um, a, a fresh lawnmower bag. So I've cut grass, um, obviously with a bit of a few other smells in there as well. Uh, and that, that smell will, will definitely permeate through the air for a lot bigger distance. So when he dropped that um, today, which he did eventually, um, he had already finished most of the carcass, so he wasn't too phased, and he, as we saw, he moved off from that area. And he's now lying, enjoying the cool evening, probably about 200 meters away from where that smell is, so probably just in case the hyenas might come to investigate, they're not going to find much to eat, but he is now long gone from that area. Hi John from California. Uh, John would like to know what dictates the size of male leopards. Is it their diet? Is it their genetics? Is it their habitat? Or all of the above? 
John, it is definitely um, a combination of all of the above. Um, but strangely enough, uh, obviously genetics will play a very important role. But diet and habitat, which go very much together, also play vital roles. I mean, a great example of this is the Cape Mountain Leopards, as they're called, that live in the Western Cape of South Africa, um, around Cape Town, um, occasionally even in Cape Town, on Table Mountain. Um, I've even seen leopard tracks in Kirsten Bosch Botanical Gardens, which is in, right in suburban Cape Town. Um, those leopards are particularly small. A big, big male leopard for that area is around 40 kilograms, um, which is even less than that sometimes, 35 to 40 kilograms, which is probably an average male leopard for this area, 75 to 80 kilograms is an average male leopard for this, this area, and a female will often weigh the same amount as a male, a female from this area will often weigh the same amount as a male from that area. And that is almost purely off diet. Um, the Feinbos region has very little um, large mammal species that live in it. So those leopards live a, a, a lot of rodents and insects and birds. So obviously with that smaller body size, I mean with a big body size, fe feeding on those small things would be very hard to sustain. Now when we get into this area, the Lofalts, which has got some of the biggest leopards in Africa, um, they have a copious amount of prey to choose from. There's lots of food around, lots of large mammal food it's from dikers and parlors and nyalas, kudu, wildebeests, in rare cases zebra and buffalo and whatnot. So there's a far greater variety of food available to them. So they're able to grow bigger because they have better quality food and that's due to the habitat because this habitat holds a lot more uh, of those large uh, species. Um, so incredibly varied that uh, the size is actually very noticeable and even if you move up north um, into Zambia and Zimbabwe and even northern Mozambique uh, where you have Miombio or Brachystegia woodland which is again a woodland that is um, very low in sort of grazing value so there are large mammals there and a lot of those are wilderness areas but the leopards there will be physically a lot smaller than leopards say from the Zambezi Valley or the low felt of South Africa um, or the Luangwa um, where they have a lot more choice of um, food items. Okay, I was just popping my jersey on. Getting a bit chilly. I'm sure Mr. Tingana is quite thankful for that with a belly full as he has. So, on a female leopard, they might stay on a, a kill the size of the diker, depending on how, how hungry they are, for even probably a day, a night, and another day. Now, with a male leopard, you see he's devoured that whole diker. He, he definitely made that kill um, probably early, early this morning. Um, or, or, yeah, probably early, early hours this morning, 1, 2 o'clock in the morning, and it is now not even uh, a full 24 hours, and he's finished and moved off. Hi Kenneth, uh, welcome back. Uh, Kenneth asked a bit earlier in the show, what would happen if Mvula and Tingana were to meet? Would they have any form of direct confrontation? Um, it's very difficult to gauge, Kenneth. It changes. Um, at the moment, I th I'm not sure. Just judging from how far Tingana is pushing into Mvula's territory, I think Mvula might try decide discretion is the better part of valor and move away. Um, but he might get pushed to the stage where there will actually be physical confrontation and those battles can be com absolutely fer ferocious. Um, at the moment I think uh, Tingana is slightly younger, uh, he's a bit bigger and looks in a bit better shape than Mvula does at the moment. And I think Mvula has decided it's better to try, move and even 
release some of his territory to uh, Tingana. And the same way Tingana has decided to do the same with Anderson Mail, who's younger, possibly a bit bigger and stronger, and who's pushing in um, from the south and west. So, very interesting. Um, if there are going to be blows, it's going to be if Mvula now gets stuck in a position between another male leopard to the south and east of him, and he's going to have to sort of fight, choose one of them to fight. And who he chooses to fight is going to be very interesting because um, he's definitely shown. So, guys, while we wait, and hopefully, Tingana does the same as those pachyderms did a little earlier and heads down to quench his thirst. We're going to cross back to Commander Bond, see what he's been up to for the last while, and we'll be back with you a little later in the show. Hi everybody, I hope you've enjoyed the leopard. Um, I am driving at some speed, not because there is an animal, uh, but because we're about to go to one of the high points of the reserve, and there is a spectacular sunset going on behind me, and I want you to see it. I, as I've said before, never tire of sunsets, and there you are. Look at that. A question, thank you very much for it. I think, if I understand correctly, from Room 11 uh, at a school in Edmonton, Canada. Oh, look at that colour. That's just spectacular. Um, you want to know how tall... You want to know how tall the tallest elephant in that um, herd was. Well, in feet... Uh, how tall in feet? Uh, probably about 10 feet. Maybe, no, not quite. Let's, let me just think about this in terms of feet. They, a lot of people burning um, fire breaks to protect the, the ground from the, the, you know, potential runaway fires. And then, there you can see the magnificence of the Drakensberg Mountains on the left-hand side of your screen, just next to that beautiful knobthorn tree that uh, VM has framed. Oh, that's marvellous. So that sort of cloud there you see isn't a cloud. It's a, it is definitely a, a smoke from various fires. I think from people burning land to um, hopefully get a last green f flush before the dry season, but mainly also to burn fire breaks so that if a runaway fire does come through the area, uh, lodges and things will be protected. Hmm. That's roughly 60 kilometers away. That slope and the mountains there. Well, it's just a nice time of the day to be quiet and contemplate life, especially after such a wonderful, wonderful elephant sighting. And we're just at the changing of the guard now. The birds are silent. The air is completely still. One or two Franklins calling an arrow mark babbler. But otherwise it's totally at peace. The air is completely fresh.
and like I've said before there's a taste to the air here I've got Viam flapping his jaw behind but it tastes like a bit of dust like it tastes old infinitely wonderful While we look at that gorgeous sunset, Cameron, aged five, at the Dayton's Children's Hospital, you want to know, did that young elephant do something naughty to have been excluded from the water like he was? Um, Cameron, the answer is most probably he did do something naughty. Um, when elephants get to a sort of teenager age, a bit like human beings, they, get, they do become a bit and then they would have disciplined him. And that's what happened there. Thanks, Cameron, for your question. It's a good one. Isn't that a beautiful sunset? Mm. Lynn and family, thank you for your question. You want to know at what age do elephants normally moo along from the herd? Uh, well, you saw the excluded young boy there. The males, the females obviously don't leave their natal herd. Natal means the herd in which they were born. Um, the bulls, though, when between sort of 13 they start to get a bit boisterous. I suspect that's roughly the age of that uh, excluded one that we saw there. Um, and between 13 and 17, they'll be tossed out of the herd. They'll eventually, by 17, they're normally spending very little time with the herd. So, 17-ish. Okay, we're not too far from Biffle's Hook Waterhole. Um, and we've come up here with a reason, of course. That is to see if uh, the bachelor of Biffle's Hook, the lone hippo bull that, tend, that lives there, uh, with whom I feel a certain sense of kinship and uh, common ground. We're going to go and see if he actually comes out of the water to eat at night or if he sulks in the water all day and all night long. Wonderful sunset. Obviously beautifully filmed by Viam. Here we go. Jersey, um, you've done some research into sleeping, sleeping uh, water animals. Um, so you you make mention of sharks having to keep moving to keep water over the gills, um, and you remind us that dolphins and other cetaceans are mammals. Um, I wonder if you wouldn't mind having a look. Uh, while I know that that they don't have to that that dolphins are air breathers. Um, Remember that if they stop, if they go to sleep, they're rather likely to sink, which will make breathing air quite difficult. So I wonder if you could find out, I think it is them that, um, whose brains go to sleep or half the brain goes to sleep while the other one's awake, just so that they can stay um, afloat and stick their, their um, nostrils out of the, or blowholes out of the water enough time to, to breathe the air. Thanks for your comments. Tiny Nyala. Tiny, tiny little Nyala lamb. Strictly a calf, not a lamb. Oh, sorry, I've parked Viam right behind a Strychnos Madagascarensis stump. There we go. Beautiful little Nyala. One can't help feeling a slight pang for him or her as we go into the night time when they're so vulnerable.
That's the closest thing to a deer that we have in South Africa. It looks like a, a deer fawn, but isn't obviously, and isn't related. Animals or antelope, especially things like impala, who's, who rut at a very specific time of year, uh, or, and, and therefore lamb at a very specific time of year, would they, if they were in captivity in Europe, uh, where obviously things are, are totally topsy-turvy compared with here, would they rut at the same time of year? Well, Tony, I think the answer to that is that what brings on the rut is the shortening of the day. And so, because it seems apparently that changes the, um, that's what causes the testosterone in the males to go up and probably brings on estrus in the females. Um, and so what I suspect happens there is that in the northern hemisphere where everything is topsy-turvy and assuming that, um, assuming that sort of they, they are fed in the same way that they would feed in the wild, um, I'm, I imagine that, yes, think that it would swap about exactly six months uh, because it is the day length but remember that your day lengths well in most parts of the where you're watching so you're at much higher altitude, uh, latitudes to us um, your day length will change substantially faster than ours and to a far greater degree so here I mean we're almost at the winter solstice now <coughs> excuse me um, it will get lengths very hugely differently so it would be interesting to see what effect that had on uh, an antelope or especially an impala in captivity there lovely question thank you and that's assuming I mean that question came from Holland that's assuming the poor old impala got to see the Sun at all living in the Drakensberg to what the ones we are seeing here um, yes there are but remember that's not in a game reserve so originally before we came along with uh, our vast numbers our guns and all sorts of other things <coughs> you would have found buffalo and right up to the base I mean there are accounts of buffalo and elephant and rhino and hippo all the way up into the mountains um, and certainly all the predators that went with them uh, and closer to there just looking at the road here some tracks never mind um, and certainly in terms of so very similar sort of species to what we would have had here now not so much um, but what you would have found is some so things like the bird species will be different because it's wetter and there are more trees there so they'll get a greater diversity of bird species and then also things like some mango monkeys uh, which tend to live in much more thickly uh, forested areas than vervet monkeys uh, they lived in they and they still live up in the in the forest there and also in the mountains things like elant tend to live at higher altitudes Bob is leaving for his evening graze. I said yesterday that I thought the northwestern corner of the reserve was probably the highest. I'm not sure that we aren't on a higher point now. And now I'm just going off it. Certainly nearby the highest point here. Let's see. To 
descending into the valley of the Biffles Hook waterhole. It is. He's got a friend. I can't believe it. <laughs> Look at this. Look, he's got a friend. <laughs> for, for our new viewers, um, welcome, and we're very pleased to have you along. And you don't have to suffer with Bob through his uh, bachelorhood and loneliness. Um, the hippo, one of these, I mean, I'm going to pretend if I tell you which one is which, but he was on his own. I think the one on the right was on his own for a long time, and he was dubbed the Bachelor of Biffles Hook, for uh, acronymed to Bob, of course. And finally, he's found a friend. I suspect the friend has found him, but that is just very exciting to see. Now, let's hope he doesn't... Um, say something silly and chase her off. <laughs> that noise behind us you can hear is a drongo that's making all sorts of uh, calls that aren't his own. Clearly they're in the very early stages of courting, just sort of eyeing each other out. Like two kids at a school social, without the, um, without the ability to WhatsApp each other, of course, so they actually have to have a face-to-face -face interaction. She's, wait, she's waiting, waiting for him to come over and ask her to dance. Go on, Bob, be brave. She ain't got anyone else to choose from. Oh, there we go. I suppose this brings up another topic, if you like. Uh, and get engaged. Some people get married. Bob's just finding love, as we see. But there's just such a sense of uh, primal romance about this place. I mean, it's not quite as romantic as it might be with Viam sitting on the back of the vehicle. I mean, if, if Viam was a, you know, a leggy blonde, it might be. But the mosquitoes. Oh, yes. Liam's not a particularly romantic person. He's just pointed out a whole lot of mosquitoes that are flying about the place. We won't worry too much about them. And those are the nests of the red-billed buffalo weaver. They're inactive at the moment. And just every so often, going across frame, you might see a bat. Probably a, a little free-tailed bat, and he'll be eating the mosquitoes that uh, Viam pointed out while I was trying to be romantic. remember I didn't say this to David and we've had lots of questions which is great but if you are a new viewer um, welcome we're very very happy to have you along and if you want to ask any questions or make any comments please feel free and feel welcome and understand
Laura, you want to know how do I know if this is a um, if this is a girl or not? Uh, the other hippo, I don't. <laughs> Could well be another bull. I'm just um, I'm hoping for Bob's sake it's a girl. Um, John boy, you think that uh, Bob is uh, cheating on me? No, 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 John boy. Um, Bob and I have a sense of solidarity with each other, um, but we'll be very cheerful. Uh, should our circumstances change, we will, we will revel in the joy of our mutual friendship and the, um, the happiness that the other has derived. But thank you for your comment. Right, I think we're going to move slowly along from here and see what else we can see. We're going to drive out onto the northern boundary and drive along there and um, maybe, maybe then Kohuma Pride will have decided to, or deigned to grace us with their presence. Uh, one lives in hope, as Bob did, and look what it got him. Right, on we go. Enjoy your night, Bob. Um, he hasn't moved at all since you were last with us, apart from lifting his head. Um, but he... Lifting his head was looked like he might think about getting on the move again. But there's quite a strong possibility, just judging from that big sigh he just gave, that he might flop straight back down. But welcome back, and hasn't it been a splendid sunset safari? Um, I heard Bob. Bob's got a girlfriend, so that's great news for Bob, the bachelor hipper of Buffalo's Hook Dam. I'm sure James will be very chuffed. Now, I think the only person who's lacking female companionship is James. Uh, I'm only joking. So even though he is resting, he is very aware of his surroundings. could do the, the whole story like we did today, uh, which is even better. Um, the fact that we found the tracks, we tracked him on foot, found him on foot, couldn't find him in the vehicle, and then found him on foot again. And then we've managed to have this fantastic, fantastic and long sighting, seeing the whole almost start to finish of how we would find an animal from the tracking to the bundu bashing and then him leading us back to the tree where he had that diker in the, in the, in the, in the tree and then actually watching him feed off that diker this afternoon uh, saying a little bit of the harsher side of nature which is always good we must remember we always try to put human emotions and and civility into the wild but it isn't a civil place and animals can do things which we consider really really nasty and and disgusting but that is how it works out here and it is survival of the fittest so i think it's good for us to sometimes see some of that more gruesome stuff it does remind us that we can't give human emotions and and try um reflect um the type of emotions that we would want to on these animals and it reminds us that they are truly wild animals part of this incredible three and a half million hectare open ecosystem that the animals are allowed to wa run free and fortunately for us we are privileged enough to have a sneak peek into their world Hi, Tyler, um, who is 12 years old from Dayton Children's Hospital, Ohio. Hi, Tyler. I hope you're having a fantastic day. Tyler would like to know what would happen if another leopard, while this leopard was away from his kill, came and started eating on that kill. Well, Tyler, that completely depends on which leopard it is. Um, if it is one of the females he regularly sees within his territory, he would probably just chase her off. 
And the same would go with um, if it was one of his cubs that have become independent and started moving around by themselves. Up to a certain age, he would tolerate them a little bit. Oh, he's gone flat cat again. Um, but he would then chase them out of the tree and then continue to feed. Um, the kill he had earlier today, he has gobbled everything up, so there's nothing left. So there's no danger of that. The only thing that might go sniffing around the bottom of that tree is a hyena to pick up some scraps. But uh, I think then if it was another leopard he didn't know, another male leopard um, who was of independent age, so who was moving around by himself and wasn't staying with his mom anymore, um, there he would probably try kill that, that, that leopard. And specifically if it was another big male leopard, he would definitely try fight with that leopard. Unless he thought that leopard was bigger, then he'd probably run away. Hi Brenda from Pennsylvania just outside Philadelphia um, welcome on the sunset safari Brenda wonderful to have you with us um, Brenda would like to know if I've personally seen two male leopards fighting over territory if so how long ago and where and um, what was the outcome um, Brenda I've heard a fight and I just got there just afterwards uh, I have never seen two male leopards actually physically going at each other. I've seen two females fighting, but I've never seen two males. Um, and that was probably in 2006 or 2007 um, in the central Sabi Sands. I heard this unbelievable commotion. And by the time I got there, unfortunately, um, the fight was over. Quite often these fights can be very brief, um, especially if the one male realizes that he's in trouble very quickly, he'll try to get out of there. Um, but sometimes I've heard of them going on for sort of about 10, 20 minutes and sometimes even having a fight, having a break and then having a fight again. Um, the female leopards I've seen fighting was very, very brutal, very, very vicious. A dominant female in that area um, came across a young, uh, young female who was probably around 18 months old and was trying to find her little niche territory and um, this dominant female absolutely beat her senseless. Um, and she, her whole eye, her whole side of her face um, was completely swollen and her whole eye was blood red. Sorry, one second. So her, her eye was completely blood red. So dark, dark blood red and you could just see the black of, of the iris. So um, leopard fights are quite aggressive. They quite, often, are often quite uh, over quite quickly, especially in a situation like that where there's two very different sized leopards, a young female and an adult female in her prime and that young female got a really big beating and then she gapped it, she ran as fast as she could. Um, with male leopards fighting, I've seen male leopards stand sort of four or five meters from each other and oh, 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 and scent mark and move and, and trying to avoid the fighting but those were two males in their prime and they decided it was worth just keeping that boundary and not actually fighting. Hi, Susan from the Netherlands. Uh, Susan has noticed that if we move along to Tingana's belly there, that all the spots are very dark and sort of full black <coughs> as you move further up than more the traditional rosettes. Um, and she'd like to know, is this the same in all leopards? Um, or is, uh, is, there, and is there a reason for this? Well, Susan, uh, no leopard has the same spots. And I've seen leopards that have more rosettes on their bellies than that. Um, but they do have a certain percentage that will be full black spots uh, generally on their lower, lower part of their body um, and it works the same way as the rosettes to break up um, the shape uh, but each individual will have a different, uh, very different pattern all over their body.
very, very, very relaxed leopard at the moment. Probably really enjoying this lovely, cool evening. Amazing how still the bush is at the moment. There's almost not a sound. I can't even hear a cricket. Andrew, can you hear any animals? Or birds? Or insects? You're the only animal I can hear now, Brent. <laughs> <laughs> Very funny, Art Fox. <laughs> Art Fox says I'm the only animal he can hear at the moment. Um, but it is amazing how sometimes these, these winter evenings are almost deathly quiet. Ah, I can hear one bird in the distance. And it's Commander Bond's favorite, the scrub robin, the white browed scrub robin. So it's amazing though, he seems to be in such a deep sleep, he's not, he's definitely listening and is very attentive to all the noises around him. And on a still evening like this, I doubt any animal could take a step near him without him hearing it. Andrew, would you like to try? <laughs> no, thank you. Evening, Gerda. Gerda says, if I hear a fiery neck nightjar, um, please could I uh, stop and listen and let her hear it because she hasn't heard it in such a long time and she's missing the bush. Gerda, strangely enough, you don't really hear them calling too often in the winter months, but I can make a special exception for you, Gerda. Uh, I think I can rustle up a fiery neck nightjar. Just give me a second or two while I see if I can pull one out of my book box. We found a fiery neck nightjar. Not quite the real thing, Kada, but I hope it gives you a little taste of the African bush. Uh, I managed to pull it out of my box. Uh, a fiery neck nightjar. Magic. Uh, I, uh, magic, magic fiery neck nightjar out of my book box. I hope you enjoyed that. Um, it is a, one of my favorite calls in the bush as well, um, but generally more common in the summer months. And playing on with that uh, sort of words that birds say, and um, us putting sort of human words. Uh, the main two groups of people we get here are the paddies and mainly the shangans, actually. And the shangans have a fascinating history that began in the days of uh, King Shaka of the Zulu. Um, he's, he has a wonderful name, does Shaka. It's Ushaga ga Sezanga Kona. Try and say that a few times. Ushaga ga Sezanga Kona. And Ushaga, uh, the, the king of the f fabled king of the Zulus, um, had a general called Manukosi. And Manukosi was the chief of a smaller red, of a smaller sort of group of, in the Zulu people called the, the Ndwandwe. And he didn't take too kindly to taking instruction from old Shaka. And he disappeared up the coastal plain of Mozambique at one stage. Um, and eventually came after, uh, came up on the Tsonga people. And 
Although the Ndwandwe were mainly Zulu speakers, um, I think they were mainly men, and they adopted the language of the Tsonga people, which is a, a Bantu language, much like Zulu. Um, structurally the same, but vocabulary is very different. And after a while, those people became the... Uh, he adopted the name, Manu Kosi adopted the name Soshangane, and his people became known henceforth, thenceforth, as the Mashangan, and in Mozambique, the Vatsonga. Um, and they then eventually filtered back across the coastal plain of Mozambique into this area here where they are settled today. And those are their villages that you can see um, in the west, nestled in the sort of lee of the mountain, or basically halfway between where we are now and where the mountains are. And there are roughly 9 million people living on the borders of the Kruger National Park uh, at the moment. Most of them in pretty poverty-stricken villages, um, but especially at this time of night, there's a really lovely feel about those villages. And it's so interesting, you know, people in those villages live on an average of probably about a thousand rand a month, if that. I mean, that would be quite a, quite a lot for most of them. There's an unemployment rate of up to 60%. But I tell you what, you drive into those villages and while there's definitely unhappiness and I don't want to over-romanticize,